morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the class on Christology. Uh, be before we begin looking at uh, chapter four, uh, can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Uh, anyone? Sri Radha, can I ask you to lead us in prayer? Can you hear me, Pastor? Yes. Okay. Father God, we thank you for this time, for this uh, wonderful morning. And uh, we surrender everything in your hand. Pastor Selena will take the class and uh, lead her in uh, by your Holy Spirit. Give us the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that we can understand your word and uh, um, everything, God. We surrender every student in your hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sri Radha. Uh, so last week, uh, we began looking at chapter 4, and uh, chapters 1, 2, and 3, we looked at uh, the deity of Jesus Christ. Uh, we looked at various scripture passages. We established from scripture that uh, Jesus is God. We looked at uh, prophecies. We looked at various uh, uh, other uh, verses in the New Testament which we studied and we established the fact from scripture that uh, Jesus is God, he is deity. Uh, now chapters 4 onwards, uh, you know, the uh, chapter 4 and the subsequent chapters uh, will examine the humanity of uh, Jesus Christ. Um, and in chapter 4, we basically began looking at, uh, uh, you know, uh, the prophecies, some important prophecies. There are many prophecies uh, regarding uh, uh, the coming of Jesus Christ uh, as the incarnate one, uh, God taking the human form. We're not talking about his second coming, but uh, in chapter 4, we were discussing uh, about some important prophecies. We studied, we looked at those prophecies concerning uh, the coming of uh, Jesus Christ, coming of the Messiah as uh, the incarnate one, as uh, the one God taking on human form, God becoming a human being. Uh, we looked at various prophecies and uh, we look at the last one uh, today and then we'll move on to chapter 5. So uh, the, the last prophecy that we will be looking or studying uh, 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 and considering is Isaiah chapter 42 verses 1. Uh, verse 6 and verse 7. So we look at uh, Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1, verse 6, and uh, verse 7. We looked at other prophecies. There are many prophecies. We did not study all of them, but we looked at a few important prophecies that uh, establishes the fact uh, oh, that, you know, God had already foreordained or foretold us that um, uh, that God would become man, that uh, or the coming of the second person of the Trinity, who is Jesus Christ, uh, uh, as the incarnate one, as God taking on human uh, form. So we looked at a couple of them um, last Wednesday. Uh, we look at the last prophecy, which we will be examining uh, today. That is Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1, verse 6, and verse 7. So can one of you please read? Uh, these verses, please, from Isaiah chapter 42. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. Uh, man, thank you, uh, Nina John. So uh, Isaiah chapter 42 is one of the four uh, servant songs that uh, we find in the book of Isaiah. So in the book of Isaiah, we find uh, four uh, scripture passages 
uh, that are called as the servant songs, which is talking about the servant here is referring to uh, Jesus. Um, how do we know that the servant is referring uh, to Jesus? We look at Acts chapter 3, verse 13. Um, but before that, just to mention that there are four servant songs in the book of Isaiah, where uh, Isaiah is uh, prophesying uh, about the coming of the Messiah, coming of the servant. So it's clearly mentioned in the Old Testament that uh, the Messiah would come would not just be a king who would, uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, uh, fighting the battles for the Jewish uh, uh, race, the Jewish nation, and giving them deliverance and um, rest and freedom uh, from their enemies. Uh, it's not a political messiah, but this is somebody who is a spiritual messiah. And that is why the Jews failed to uh, look at all the Old Testament prophecies interpreted in context, see it and look at Jesus as the Messiah who is uh, uh, God incarnate, who is the servant and not this political Messiah who they were looking for. So they interpreted it in their own terms, in their own context, in the way they wanted to see this Messiah, in the way that would benefit them in their present uh, physical uh, situation. Uh, than their spiritual, you know, so they were looking at somebody who would give them deliverance from the Roman rule because the Romans uh, were heavily taxing uh, these, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the Christians, you know, um, uh, they were uh, uh, putting taxes on every little thing, even for uh, uh, religious things they were taxed. Uh, and they were paying huge tax. That was one thing. The second thing was uh, there was severe uh, persecution uh, for the Christians. And um, also, you know, um, there was a lot of uh, uh, the culture, the Roman culture that was getting into the religious system that had already got into the religious system and uh, things that uh, the Jewish people uh, were not happy about. So they were looking and they were, it was a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it was a kairos time. It was a fullness of time because here was the Romans were, uh, sorry, the Israelites were looking for the Messiah and Jesus came uh, at the kairos moment at the fullness of time you know uh, but they failed to see him as that spiritual messiah that was you know foretold in the old testament so here we see that uh, you know uh, jesus is referred to as uh, a servant um, uh, and the servant here uh, mentioned in verse one behold my servant and if you look at the servant is a capital s and it's referring to uh, jesus christ so how do we know it's referring to jesus christ uh, let's look at uh, acts chapter 3 verses uh, verse 13 so one of you can please turn to acts chapter 3 verse 13 um, someone else can turn to uh, uh, isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 uh, to 3. They can read from Isaiah 61 verses 1 to 3 and someone else can turn to Luke chapter 4 verses 18 and 19. So it's Acts 3 13, Isaiah 61 verses 1, 2 and 3 and Luke chapter 4 verses 18 and uh, 19. So can somebody please read Acts 3 13 please? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his son, his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Thank you. So uh, here in this uh, in this chapter of Acts chapter 3, is, you know, uh, uh, Peter is uh, preaching a sermon and he's, uh, he's referring to Jesus as you know, a servant here, uh, he says, glorify God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant, uh, Jesus Christ. That's not mentioned his son, but mentions his servant, uh, Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, Peter is saying, whom you people delivered uh, and denied in the presence of Pilate and, you know, um, was crucified and dead, but he rose again. Okay, so the servant uh, that Isaiah speaks about is Jesus, which Peter refers to, uh, or whom Peter refers to as Jesus. Okay, Isaiah 61 verses 1, 2, and 3. Can somebody please read that?
Can somebody please read Isaiah 61, verses 1, 1 to 3? To preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable, acceptable year of the Lord and the day of begins vengeance, vengeance of our vengeance. God, to comfort, to comfort all who mourn, to counsel those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, uh, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Thank you. Amen to that. So here we see that the servant who is referred to as Jesus Christ, who, uh, you know, uh, uh, Isaiah is writing about, he says that, you know, uh, God says, I have put my spirit upon him. Okay. Uh, so the servant uh, who is Jesus Christ, uh, God is saying, you know, I have put my spirit upon him. Um, and we also read this in Isaiah chapter 61, verse, verse 1, 2, and 3, uh, where, you know, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me, which is talking about uh, the Messiah who would come and uh, who would, uh, you know, declare these words. And we see uh, it was fulfilled uh, when Jesus came, uh, you know, he went to the synagogue, uh, he opened the scriptures and he uh, reads from Isaiah chapter 61 verses uh, 1, 2, uh, verse 1, 2 and 3. Uh, let's look at uh, Luke chapter 4 verses 18 and 19. Can somebody read that please? me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the lord amen thank you so here when uh, jesus reads this out uh, in the hearing of all the people who have uh, gathered in the synagogue, he says, uh, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Okay, so, uh, uh, you know, he's quoting this, he's reading from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 uh, to 3, and he says, you know, that the scripture has been fulfilled or what God has, uh, uh, you know, foreordained or what God has um, prophesied or revealed through his prophet um, uh, uh, Isaiah that you know the the Messiah would come the spirit of the Lord God would be upon him and uh, Jesus says I am that Messiah and uh, the scripture what was uh, prophesied is being fulfilled in your uh, hearing okay so we see that Jesus uh, who is a servant who is referred to as a servant uh, uh, and who is spoken of as one whom uh, you know um, God's soul delights in and on whom he has put out his spirit. Uh, we see that uh, also in, uh, uh, we read about this also in Isaiah 61 verse 1 to 3 and uh, Jesus declaring it um, or uh, reading the scripture passage uh, which we look at in uh, Luke chapter 4 verse 18 and 19 and Jesus says this uh, scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing or this prophecy has come true. And so we uh, will move on with uh, what we looked at the the servant song that we're looking at in isaiah chapter 42 verses 1 6 and uh, 7 um it says that uh, you know uh, he will bring forth justice to the uh gentiles he will bring forth uh justice to the uh gentiles so you know uh, uh, uh that we look at that in detail but uh uh the servant who would come, the Messiah would come, uh, would bring forth uh, justice to the Gentiles. I'll explain that and you'll understand what it means. It also, uh, uh, the prophecy goes on to say that I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and I will hold your hand and I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the 
uh, people. So uh, the servant who would come, who is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the incarnate God uh, in human form, he will make a new covenant. He will be uh, a light to the Gentiles. Uh, he would uh, open blind eyes. He would uh, set the captives free, deliver people from uh, strongholds, demonic oppressions, and those who sit in darkness from prison house. So we see all of these things, you know, fulfilled uh, in the person and work of Jesus Christ uh, while he lived here on this earth uh, or in his three years of ministry where we see that, you know, he came as a servant, he washed his disciples' feet, he came to um, minister to people, uh, and he was not that political a king or messiah they were looking for, um, uh, uh, and on him was uh, the Spirit of God, and we see that Jesus says, uh, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. Uh, he comes to bring justice to the Gentiles. We'll study that in detail. And also he, we see that through his, uh, you know, uh, uh, the miracles that Jesus did, uh, we see that he opens blind eyes. He makes the, uh, 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 the mute speak. Uh, uh, the deaf fear, he raised people from the dead, and also those who were in demonic oppression or bondage, he set them uh, free. Now, we look at, um, you know, um, three important things that we can, um, three important facts that we can uh, learn about the servant, or we can, three important facts that we can notice about the servant who is uh, Jesus Christ. The first thing that, uh, uh, the first fact that we can learn from this, uh, this prophecy that Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1, 6, and 7, the first thing is that, you know, the servant uh, was to uh, be given as a covenant to the uh, people, okay? So the covenant here is referring to the new covenant uh, with Jesus, who Jesus, um, uh, with, uh, you know, it was established uh, when Jesus came, when he died on the cross, and he established this covenant uh, by his blood. Okay, so all covenants that were made in the Old Testament uh, uh, was a, is a blood covenant because that was the culture in, uh, in that time. Also, it meant that uh, this covenant, uh, you know, meant life for life. It was a lifelong commitment. And if the person did not keep this covenant, you know, uh, the other person can uh, demand his life. So it is a life for life. Uh, it is, uh, you know, uh, it is also that, uh, you know, it's a covenant which is a, uh, something that cannot be broken, uh, uh, an unbreakable uh, 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 covenant, a promise that you cannot go back on because your very life uh, depends on it. So we see all of the covenants that God made in the Old Testament was true, uh, uh, you know, the sacrifice of an animal. It was the animal that was slain and the blood uh, that was shed. But in the new covenant, uh, uh, it was established um, by the blood of Jesus. Jesus himself, <clears throat> sorry, Jesus himself dying on the cross and, uh, you know, uh, 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 shedding his blood uh, through which he initiated or brought about um, the new covenant. Okay, so the first fact that we will look at through the, in this prophecy is that um, the servant who is referred to as Jesus Christ was given as a covenant to uh, the people. So Jesus established the new covenant. He established it in his uh, blood. <coughs> uh, but notice what uh, you know. This verse talks about the servant that the servant himself was to be given as a uh, covenant. Uh, look at uh, what it says. I will keep you and give you as a covenant uh, to the people. So the, you know, I will keep you. The you is uh, referring to the servant who is Jesus Christ. Um, and give you as a covenant to the people is, um, again, the you here is referring uh, to Jesus Christ. So Jesus himself uh, was given as a covenant to the uh, people, but in the Old Testament, you know, God required an animal to be given um, as a uh, uh, as a sacrifice. Uh, the the blood of the animal uh, on which was established the uh, covenant that God makes with mankind. But here, 
uh, in the new covenant, which is much greater than the old covenant, which is built on better promises, is because it was is established on the blood of uh, Jesus Christ. So, uh, uh, scripture teaches us that Jesus is the one who establishes the new covenant, and uh, you know he is also the priest. Uh, as we read in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 uh, to 15, talks about him being the priest who officiates, which means who oversees or performs the duty in this new covenant by the sprinkling of his um, blood. So Jesus Christ is the one who established the new covenant. And how did he establish the new covenant? Through his own blood, which he shed on the cross, giving his very life. And the other thing is uh, scripture also reveals to us that uh, Jesus Christ, uh, who is referred to as the servant, uh, you know, is the priest who officiates, that means who performs, who oversees uh, the duties of a priest uh, in the covenant by the sprinkling uh, of the uh, blood. So look at uh, Isaiah chapter 52 verse 15 and Hebrews chapter 9 verse 11 and 15. Uh, 11 to 15. So can somebody please read Isaiah 52 verse 15 and somebody else can read Hebrews 9 verses 11 to 15, please. Hussal, we sprinkle many nations. King shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them, they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. Amen. Thank you. So here we see that so shall he, which is talking about the Messiah, the uh, Jesus Christ, uh, sprinkle many nations. It does, it does not mean that God can, you know, is so powerful that he can take or uh, have nations uh, at the tip of his fingers and just sprinkle them like that. It's not referring to or giving us that idea it's here he's saying that you know he will sprinkle many nations which means you know through his blood you know he will cleanse uh, many nations he will make people uh, righteous now um, uh, you know this word sprinkle uh, was very um, uh, a, a word that was common or uh, a ritual that uh, you know was common uh, to the Jews uh, you know, um, the priest would um, uh, sacrifice uh, uh, the animal and they, he would take the blood and he would sprinkle it on all the, you know, um, uh, the equipment or the vessels in the tabernacle. And when it is the blood is sprinkled, uh, it just signifies that all of them are uh, sanctified and made holy and set apart. Uh, for, uh, you know, holy purpose, that is to serve God. Also, the blood would be sprinkled on the uh, people, uh, which uh, which also, uh, you know, uh, uh, signifies that, um, uh, you know, the blood is uh, has cleansed them, that, uh, you know, uh, th that they're covered with the blood, the blood uh, that of the animal uh, covers their sins, uh, and they would not incur the wrath of God. But more importantly is, uh, you know, once in a year when uh, the, the high priest enters the Holy of Holies, uh, he would uh, sacrifice, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 an animal and make atonement for his own sins and also, uh, uh, you know, for the sins of uh, the entire uh, 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 the people of Israel. And then he would enter the Holy of Holies and, you know, he would take that uh, uh, blood of that animal and he would sprinkle it on the, uh, you know, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, uh, he would sprinkle it between those, the two cherubims uh, with their wings, uh, uh, the, that is called the mercy seat uh, on top of the Ark of the Covenant where uh, the two cherubims are like this and then there is the, the place, the mercy seat. And the mercy seat is uh, the place where, you know, God would come and would meet with man you know god who is holy who's pure uh, cannot uh, you know come near um, 
us as sinners, but this blood that is sprinkled over there on the mercy seat, which uh, which refers to God having mercy upon us, and uh, Him then you know the presence of God will come on the tabernacle, and uh, you know God would speak uh, to the uh, the priest. So that sprinkling of the blood on the mercy seat would actually give access to a uh, man to come before the throne of grace. Um, who come before the holy presence of God uh, to meet uh, uh, God. So uh, the sprinkling of blood was something that was um, uh, 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 very significant uh, in the Jewish uh, uh, religious system. And they knew this very well. And also they knew that just sprinkling on the blood would, you know, sanctify them, uh, give them access into that holy place where God would meet with man. That is why when Jesus uh, died on the cross, you know, he shed his blood, the, 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 uh, the curtain of the temple tore into two, which which gives us now, uh, you know, because of that blood that was shed and the officiating of this new covenant was established on the blood of Jesus Christ, you know, uh, mankind now has access, uh, uh, you know, uh, into the presence of God. God can meet, a man can meet with God. They have uh, that uh, access into the presence of God. They can approach the mercy seat of God they, and, uh, you know, they can receive grace and help in their time of need. And so this is what is, you know, talking about uh, so shall he sprinkle uh, many nations. And also we see that uh, Jesus Christ, you know, not only... Uh, establishes the new covenant but he's also the priest who officiates which means you know now he's sitting to the right hand of god but he's uh, as a high priest you know intercede not just interceding on behalf of us but officiating on behalf of us um uh, by performing the duties or overseeing the covenant by the sprinkling of blood, which means that every time we sin, you know, uh, we incur the wrath of God. So God, uh, who is just, uh, who is uh, right in what he does, you know, as soon as he sees sin, uh, there is judgment that is passed. But Jesus Christ as a high priest uh, uh, in the heavenlies, uh, before the throne of God, uh, you know, uh, rem it reminds God of the sacrifice that he he's made, the new covenant that he's established uh, in the blood, by his blood. And hence, what we receive is not uh, the wrath of God, but we receive the grace um, of God. And hence, you know, our sins are atoned for, our sins are covered, uh, we are forgiven, and we do not... Uh, you know, um, we do not uh, 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 immediately receiving the uh, punishment. And so Jesus is the high priest on behalf of us who is uh, officiating uh, uh, the new covenant by the sprinkling of his blood, which we read in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 to 15. So can one of you please read uh, his verses in Hebrews 9, verses 11 to 15, please? But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Amen. Thank you, Nina John. So here we see that, you know, um, uh, when the blood of bulls and goats, which, you know, uh, 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 the Israelites sacrificed, uh, which would make them, uh, you know, uh, would sanctify them, purify them, uh, 
uh, in the presence of God so God can come and speak to them. God's wrath does not come upon them. You know, their sins are atoned for. But it was just a partial covering of sins. It was not a permanent covering of sins. And that is why they had to offer sacrifices again and again and again. Every time they sinned, you know, they had to offer a sacrifice. But we don't have to offer sacrifices every time we sin because um, of uh, Jesus Christ, uh, who's God incarnate, uh, God uh, who became man and who made the full, sufficient and perfect uh, sacrifice and uh, who redeemed us, uh, you know, from the sins and, uh, you know, brought us into this new covenant in which we receive um, mercy and grace um, uh, by faith. So, you know, uh, and Jesus continues to officiate uh, this new covenant. So he's the one who establishes uh, this new covenant. Uh, he is the one who continues to officiate, uh, even though he is, um, uh, you know, he, he rose again, he ascended, seated at the right hand of God, but he continues uh, his uh, uh, His role as our high priest uh, who is officiating uh, the new covenant okay and this is something that we can celebrate is something that we rejoice um, something that we can be mindful of every day that uh, you know god gave his very life for us uh, and uh, uh, even as we are part of this new covenant, uh, you know, covenant uh, in, in, is between two people and covenant is life for life. That means when God gave his his whole life for us, you know, and we uh, we come into covenant relationship, which means we also uh, uh, when we are saying yes to that new covenant and we become part of that new covenant, it means that we give our whole lives. So you don't draw back anything. We don't we held uh, anything but in everything whether it's in our thoughts our desires our motives our choices our decisions the words we speak our actions everything you know um, uh, 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 is uh, is what we commit to or uh, holiness and righteousness in our uprightness because we are making this covenant which uh, where God gave his very life and it uh, you know uh, he's asking for our lives as well all he's asking is our life so we place our whole lives on the uh, altar so if when we place our own lives on the altar we receive um, like this verse says in the uh, the last part of verse 15 says a promise of eternal inheritance that means we uh, receive eternal life not something that we we will enjoy only in the future uh, in heaven but it is something that uh, is a realized eschatology which means it is a truth that uh, eschatological hope which means something way in the future but it's something that is realized now which you can experience now we can experience that eternal life that fullness of life we can live it here now in the uh, present but if you are not willing to you know uh, give our own whole lives at the altar we incur you know eternal judgment eternal death so it can be eter either eternal inheritance or eternal life or it is eternal death because it is life for uh, life. And so we need to be so conscious of, uh, you know, uh, what we are part of, who we are, what we have partaken. You know, the moment we said yes to Christ, we've accepted him as our, our Lord and Savior, uh, which means we're saying uh, we are part of that new covenant and it requires us uh, to give our entire lives, our whole being, not withholding anything, uh, from him, which means being uh, honoring God, being holy in every aspect of our lives, every fiber of our being, every cell, every thought, everything that we do has to be holy and pleasing. Uh, all of us are not perfect, you know, but we are, uh, you know, we need to work out our salvation. That is what we need to do on a day-to-day -day, um, basis. And also as the part of this new covenant, he is the testator, uh, which means a testator is somebody, uh, is a person uh, who dies leaving a will or a testament in force, which means, you know, uh, you know, if uh, the person uh, makes a will while he is living, that will is not... Uh, does not come into effect uh, when he is living, but it comes into effect once he is dead. 
so what uh, when he is living he is still the owner of all of his uh, finances his bank account his money in the bank uh, the the property that that he owns everything but once he dies you know the the will that he leaves or the test or it's called a will or testament that he leaves comes into effect comes into force and those who uh, you know whose names are there in that will or in that testament will receive or be benefactors of um, uh, all that this person has left so jesus is the testator or the you know uh, he's the one who died um, on the cross and when he died on the cross you know he made this new covenant effective so the new covenant became effective which means um, all of the blessings all of the promises um, that we can inherit uh, uh, because of this new covenant that Jesus made in his blood which was effective after he was dead you know uh, 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 we become and we become part of we are the benefactors we receive uh, everything that Jesus has established by his blood in the new covenant so you know uh, it's uh, the, the, when we become part of the new covenant covenant is not something that uh, you know we are just giving in and we don't receive but it's something that we wholly give of our whole selves but we receive more than what we just give we receive every spiritual blessing every physical blessing emotional blessing um, everything you know uh, supernatural blessings as well because we are part of this new covenant because Jesus Christ is a testator he's or the one who died uh, to make this covenant uh, uh, effective look at what uh, Isaiah chapter 53 verse 8 says can one of you please read that please Isaiah 53 verse 8 Isaiah 53, chapter 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. Amen. Thank you, Jackin. So here we see that Jesus was uh, taken from prison and from judgment. Prison basically means, you know, when he was brought before Pilate, um, and he was, uh, you know, uh, Pilate was questioning him. They were, uh, uh, you know, him and all of that. So that's talking about prison and, uh, you know, the judgment that was passed on. Um, and who will declare his generation? Basically, it's referring to the fact that Jesus had no, uh, uh, you know, uh, children because he was human. But, you know, in spite of being human, he did not have uh, 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 children, but uh, you know, uh, through the covenant that he made, uh, we become part of that covenant uh, as sons and daughters of God and part of that um, uh, covenant. And uh, you know, uh, he says he was cut off from the land of the living, which means he died. Uh, for our sins, uh, for the sins of the people, for the transgressions of the people, he was stricken, he was beaten, and uh, he uh, he died, and hence he established the new uh, covenant. Okay. Um, also, we can look at um, Hebrews chapter uh, uh, nine, verse sixteen and seventeen. So, can somebody read that, please? Hebrews nine, sixteen and seventeen. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while that test testator lives. Okay, amen. So here it says, for there is a testament, means testament, which I said, a will. Okay, uh, in our uh, context, we, uh, we speak as, uh, we refer it to as will. Okay, so here it's referring to as testament. There must also of necessity be the death of the testator, which means, you know, uh, the person who's writing the will or the testament, you know, only after he dies, that will or that testament comes into effect. It comes into effect uh, and people who have, uh, uh, been mentioned in that testament of will you know become the benefactors of the will that has been left behind by this person only after his death 
So here it says, for a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. So here again, as we looked in, in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 8, Jesus was cut off from the land of the living, which means he, uh, he was dead, uh, he died. Uh, and through his blood, he established the new covenant. Um, he left a will. Uh, not a, it's not talking about leaving a will in the terms of leaving it for his children, because here it says, and who will declare his generation? That means he did not have children. So there's nobody uh, after him to declare his generation. But, uh, you know, it's talking about uh, he left his will in the sense of a spiritual uh, 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 spiritual children uh, that uh, 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 you know he uh, will uh, inherit uh, because he's God and also because of what he has done on the uh, cross so he's not talking about physical will in terms of property physical benefits monetary benefits but it's talking about a spiritual uh, will that he left because he did not have any a uh, uh, generation. So if um, if uh, people ask you, you know, uh, how do we know that uh, Jesus did not uh, marry, he did not have any children? Well, you can, uh, uh, you know, talk about the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 8 and talk about how we are his spiritual uh, inheritance. Okay. Um, so that is Hebrews chapter 9 verses 16 and 17. And also from this verse that we are studying from, uh, you know, Isaiah chapter 42, we also see that he himself is the covenant, which means uh, Jesus is the new covenant, which means a new covenant is embodied in him, uh, which means all of uh, what this uh, new covenant is, uh, is expressed, is uh, represented, uh, is personified, is symbolized, is exemplified in the person and the work of uh, Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ, you know, uh, did not just officiate or bring about the new covenant, but he himself uh, is the new covenant. It is embodied in him, which means it's expressed in him, represented in him, exemplified, personified, symbolized in him. Uh, even as uh, we look at uh, his life and his ministry here on earth, we can understand what are the benefits that we receive in the new covenant because it is embodied in the Messiah. The second fact that we can learn from Isaiah chapter 42 is that the servant was to open blind eyes, bring prisoners out, and those who sit in darkness out of the prison uh, house. And we looked at the scripture passage where Jesus says, um, you know, declared that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he says the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Uh, we also see in, uh, in various places uh, in um, in the scripture where, uh, you know, where he heals the sick, raises the dead, you know, makes the blind see and uh, uh, the deaf hear and the mute uh, speak. So, and also set those uh, uh, in bondage of the evil one, uh, uh, deliver them, set them um, free. Okay. Uh, we look at another passage in scripture, Isaiah chapter 9, nine verse uh, 1 and 2. Can one of you please read that, please? Isaiah chapter 9 verses 1 and 2. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. Amen. Thank you, Jackin. So here, uh, you know, um, uh, we see uh, the prophet Isaiah, you know, uh, prophesying what is going to happen to, um, you know, the, the land of uh, Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, those living by the sea of uh, uh, Galilee, and he says he bring he begins uh, this verse by saying, "Nevertheless, the gloom, basically gloom, is uh, you know is what he has been talking about uh, uh, in verse uh, uh, chapter eight of Isaiah. We have this verse, what we read now was chapter nine. Uh, basically, gloom means despair, misery, darkness." 
so the gloom that carries over from what he's been talking about from Isaiah chapter 8, where in Isaiah chapter 8, he's basically warning Judah uh, of, uh, you know, of the invasion of the Assyrians. Um, and in verse uh, 22 of chapter uh, 8 of Isaiah, he says, and they will look to the earth and see trouble and darkness, gloom of anguish, and they will be driven into darkness. So he's basically talking about the people living in Judah. You know, they're going to see misery, trouble, um, great trouble and, uh, you know, to the point of uh, darkness and, uh, you know, where they can't see any hope, they can't see any light because the Assyrians are going to come and invade them and destroy whole of Judah and take them um, uh, captives. And he says that, you know, it will be very terrible uh, for the Jewish people, especially for those uh, in the northern regions, uh, the land of Zebulun and the land of Nathali, uh, which is, you know, referred to as the land of uh, the, the promised land, Zebulun and the land of um, and Naphtali. Um, so the northern regions of the promised land around the Sea of Galilee, uh, which here is referred to in um, Isaiah chapter 9, which uh, we read uh, verse 1 and 2, uh, where it talks about, um, you know, uh, uh, the Galilee of the Gentiles is basically referring uh, to uh, Zebulun and Naphtali. Uh, these two tribes uh, living by the Sea of Galilee were the tribes that incurred most of the wrath of the Assyrians uh, when they, uh, you know, when the Assyrians uh, invaded the north part of the Promised Land. Um, you know, these these two tribes uh, living in that uh, portion of the land were severely, uh, you know, uh, ravaged. They were, uh, you know, uh, beaten very badly. They were destroyed. The devastation was really bad. Uh, there was much ruin and plunder. But, uh, you know, um, God is promising uh, through the prophecy that he gives to Isaiah that even though these two places in the promised land were ravaged, were, you know, destroyed completely and there was terrible destruction that happened, but, uh, you know, and they were plundered terribly by the Assyrians, he says that, you know, um, <clears throat> These, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, people living by the Sea of Galilee will one day have a special uh, uh, blessing, okay? Uh, and uh, we see that, uh, you know, Matthew quotes, uh, uh, you know, this passage even as he speaks um, uh, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 12 to 16. Can, uh, you know, one of you please read Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 to 16, please? Because this promise which Isaiah uh, foretells in Isaiah chapter 9, you know, we see uh, uh, Matthew referring, uh, speaking about it, and we see that this prophecy that uh, these two, uh, this portion of the land of uh, northern, the northern uh, region of the promised land, which was really devastated because of the Assyrians, uh, even though they saw darkness and gloom, uh, God is promising that there will be a time when they will be um, uh, will receive special blessings because uh, you know they're going to see the light of the uh, uh, Messiah. Because in God's mercy, you know, uh, even though they suffered so much, but in God's mercy, they will be the first to see uh, the light of the Messiah. And Matthew quotes this passage uh, as clearly fulfilled in the Galilean ministry of. Um, uh, Jesus, because most of the uh, ministry that uh, uh, of Jesus, a majority of his ministry uh, took place in the northern area of Israel around the Sea of Galilee. And uh, God certainly did have a special blessing for this once, uh, you know, uh, uh, destroyed uh, part of uh, uh, the promised land, which was northern Israel. So can one of you please read um, uh, Matthew? Matthew chapter uh, 4, verses 12 to 16, please. Now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and the shadow of death, light has dawned. Amen. You know, it just uh, shows us that uh, even though God 
uh, is uh, you know a, a righteous God, a just God, and has to punish uh, sin. There's no way about it because he that's his nature. He can't go on back on his nature, which will cause him to cease to be God. And because he's God, he's righteous and just, and he's a God who punishes sin, who condemns sin. Uh, but at the same time, we see that you know he's a God who is also uh, the other side of him is you know he's a God who's gracious and compassionate and um, slow to anger and forgiving and uh, a God who abounds in in love. So you know, sometimes when we um, uh, you know suffer uh, because of the consequences of our sin um, and you know because of our sin we go away from God and uh, the protection of God is away from us. Us, and we incur, you know, uh, suffering and pain and sickness and whatever, you know, uh, we can be mindful of this fact that, you know, this God that we serve, we are in covenant with, you know, who established this new covenant is a God who will also, you know, show mercy and grace and, um, and love and a God who restores, you know, that's so wonderful to see that, you know, um, when we come back, God restores us. Uh, the reason why he punishes us also sometimes why we face consequence for sin is also we will uh, we will come uh, we will be reminded of the fact that you know sin is causing so much of chaos and pain and suffering uh, in our lives that going back to God is going to restore us and he will take us back and put us in a place where he uh, you know he envisioned for us where he has um, you know kept for us where he positioned us to be and we can receive his grace and mercy so this land which suffered greatly the northern part of Israel uh, will also be the one who would uh, receive special blessings as and we see it was fulfilled in what Isaiah prophesied uh, God told him to write about prophesied we see uh you know matthew talking about it and says that this is clearly fulfilled in the galilean ministry of um, jesus okay we'll stop here we'll come and look at the third fact uh, after break um, thank you everyone and i'll see you after the break